Hello everybody, this is Ninja Rao, you here with a second take of this video because the first time I had my mic muted. Um, so today's video is going to be on what makes a great testing phase. Um, in case those of you saw, there was a conversation I had with Warguy, um, and by conversation I mean he wrote something, I replied to it, so yeah, great long term conversation there. Um, this shows what my human interactions are like. Um, <laughs> There's a conversation, I'm going to keep calling it that, I had with Wargo, um, where it in, basically he said that I should do a video on sort of my opinion and the sort of opinion of the old jaded guy in the community um, on what testing is like. And what he didn't realise is that I've already done that video. It's on my computer right now. And I, okay, no, the audio's on my computer right now, and I just never really had the heart to publish it, because it's not a very happy video, it's just a video of me being sort of down on everything, and no one really wants to hear that. Like, that's just not particularly fun, it's not particularly fun for me to make, for me to make. it wasn't particularly fun for me to edit, and so, yeah, I never ended up publishing that. Um, and so, today, rather than talking about something like that, I want to talk about what makes a great testing phase. Because this isn't just something which is particularly topical now that we've got DLU going into a new testing phase, because we know what the winter testing is going to contain, pretty much, like we can make a very, very good guess at it. Um, snowballs, hopefully. Um, we know roughly what it's going to contain, and we know... And we have basically no idea, but we can still make some fair guesses about what closed beta is going to contain. So it's sort of a question of what's going to happen after then. And specifically, I want to ask this question because what makes a great testing phase can sort of determine when this community moved from, as I've put it loads of times in the past, a waiting community into a gaming community. At the moment, we are a community waiting for developers to release the next version of the game. And every time we... Um, get a new testing phase and nothing much really changes then we go back to waiting again until the next testing phase um, and so what's really going to change that is a truly great testing phase that gets people genuinely invested in the game so that then comes back to this question of what makes a great testing phase so I've put down on my little piece of paper it's not a piece of paper it's a notepad um, as in the program, not as in the physical notepad, although I do have a notepad in front of me um, of the physical variety. Anyway, uh, I've got down here two things, variation and progression. Now, both of these, when I think about it, I did a little bit of research into sort of behavioural game design a while back, because, you know, why not? Um, and one of the things, and these are both things that are actually like strong uh, features in behavioural game design. Um, so, variation. Um, most behavioural game design is basically taken from locking a rat in a box and giving it some way of getting some food. Um, food corresponds in game design to some sort of reward, the way of getting it corresponds to playing the game. Um, one of the most famous studies involves putting a rat in a box with a, um, with a button to get the food, and one of the in one of the rats in one of the boxes presses the button and every 10 times it presses the button it gets food. Um, another rat in another box presses the button and it has a every time it presses the button it has a 1 in 10 chance of getting food. Now the rat in the box with the 1 in 10 chance of getting food, even though on average it gets as much food as the other rat, will always press the button far more. Something about it being random and there not being this certainty of when you're going to get it next, that really drives minds to keep do, to keep uh, performing a repetitive action and can get people to perform it far more often. Um, arguably, it's the reason why people um, indulge in... I say indulge, like that makes it seem like it's a bad thing. It's the reason why we have people doing creative things rather than just everyone becoming accountants, because people find it far more satisfying to sort of gamble with their time and on the likelihood of people liking what they produce um, for the prospect of a better reward. It's arguable, it's that way. And like I sort of do that myself with physics. I'm making a huge gamble with my time in the past, what, seven years I've been working on 
holograms. Um, yeah, it's a huge gamble, uh, but as humans, we are innate gamblers. Um, and so variation basically discusses if I play the game multiple times, will I get the same outcome? And this isn't completely linked with randomness because it does include the fact that you might change the way you're playing um, and you may be trying to optimize the outcome. But it's, it's linked with randomness and it's linked with the idea that you won't always be able to predict the outcome of what's going to happen. Then you've got progression, which is actually the first time I was recording this, I hadn't actually realized, but this was another one of those things that came up when I was researching behavioral game design. Um, and yeah, progression is uh, pretty much the idea that you work longer, at some, you work at something, you become more invested, you become better at it. And one of the things with progression is that the very fact that you've progressed sort of becomes reward in and of itself. You uh, specifically, a great example of this is at speedruns. The game is no longer giving you a reward for getting faster and faster. Mario doesn't care if you complete the game in under 4 minutes 55 seconds. However, people still drive themselves to keep, complete, uh, to keep completing at faster and faster times. And I get this an example of how sort of progression begins to act as its own reward. Um, and so, firstly, I'm going to discuss progression. So, because currently progression is the main way we actually have of getting enjoyment from any of these games at the moment, because there isn't much variation. Currently, most games have a static map. The most variation they generally have is, I don't know, smashables. Um, maybe you could argue the fact that um, depending on how you run up to a Stromling and LCDRU, it may or may not get one hit on you before you kill it, or the fact that a Spidelings and LCDRU are bugging and spawn um, sort of uh, pop up through the floor when you walk towards them. But aside from aside from those things, um, pretty much there's not much room for variation, um, and so your main way of getting enjoyment from these is progression. The only issue is that progression is limited by features. Missions, uh, missions, for example, are either completed or not. Um, and so missions don't really provide a great sense of progression, which is a problem given that lots of times people see implementing more missions as a sign of service getting further on. But just implementing loads of missions on its own doesn't give you that sense of progression. Um, because if, if the only challenges being presented are low skill, then competing in terms of skill just ends up compete being competing in terms of time. Who can spend the most time grinding at this? Which isn't as fun. It still gives you a sense of progression, but it doesn't give you this. It gives you the sense. The, the reward you get is not the reward of knowing you've gotten better at something. It's simply the reward given to you by the game. So the sort of thing is, OK, missions won't help much, but there isn't much room at the moment for other challenges. There's nothing really to get a high score on. Um, so the only thing we're left with really is time based challenges as a way of giving yourself a score. And they typically need to be short time based challenges, because if they're long time based challenges, you end up just competing who can put the most hours and it becomes a grind like challenge and it's probably not going to be around fighting because no current implement DLU's current implementation of AI, no not current the last implementation of AI that DLU was using yeah didn't really work too well for fighting because they could hit you from a long way off and it was really blaggy and buggy um, and LCDRU they just stand in one place and it's who can hit fastest, who can DPS. Um, and so speedruns now basically are the main competition that has got people onto their clients. The only problem with speedruns is they're limited by having interesting places to speedrun. The monument is pretty much the only interesting place to speedrun because it's got that element of there being multiple paths and it being vertical. Um, and yeah, the entire fun of speedruns and speedrunning is having lots of things that people can optimise. The only problem is that you can't optimise server-side glitches because you never know when 
uh, LCD IU or DLU comes out. Those may just be any glitches which are on the particular version you're playing or on the original LU might just get patched. Um, and there's no real way to say work around the ordering of missions, which is a huge problem because missions gate your ability to get to different worlds. You can't do a C butterscorch speedrun um, solely based on the time it takes you to get from uh, uh, the Venture Explorer to the end of the Van Gardens, which you can do in like a couple of minutes. Um, because you've got to, if you're just getting the distance, because you've got to complete the the missions to get off of the Van Gardens. Um, so, yeah, you can, there's not too much room for having an interesting speedrun there, because once you've gotten down to the theoretical minimum of 25 seconds, I think, last estimate of the minimum anyway, on the monument, there's nothing much anyone else can do, really. Um, and the other thing to note about progression is that it is damaged by short server opening times, since you need a degree of practice to get better at these things. Um, and I'm going to come back to that uh, a bit later on. Um, which then leads us to variation, is the second thing. Um, this we don't have much of in the game at, mo at the moment. Um, and it's the idea that um, content is varied within the game somehow. Um, it can be literally new content being added to the game, but uh, that's pretty difficult. And let's face it, we'd all prefer the variation of content that is moving from an unfinished game to a finished game at the moment. So we'd sort of be looking at features which give us variation. And in general, those are scenarios which change based on our actions. Uh, um, okay, which can be done feature-wise, but it can also be done far more simply by the addition of other people. Um, and this is what makes testing phases, or can make testing phases, particularly fun. Um, and another thing that generally I'd like to point out is that mod abuse can be decent fun. So um, previous DLU testing phase uh, that I took part in, um, the main activity that was going on was just the DLU mods randomly spawning in really, really high level stuff that wouldn't even attack us, but people would just grind it because it's just fun to see random high level stuff randomly spawning in. Um, so if we're going to look at other people, then there's the question of how to get other people into the server. So without having a critical number of players, you can't have enough players on at once to keep things active. If, say, I join LCDIU at the moment, unless I've got a particular plan for what I'm going to do, say a monument speedrun, um, then there's a fair chance I'll just leave fairly quickly because there'll be no one else online for me to play with. Um, and so things have a tendency to stay inactive once they become inactive. They tend not to spontaneously leave inactivity. But we know that large players, player numbers are a huge problem for servers for a multitude of reasons, from server stability to pressure on developers. So how to reduce that critical number of players we need to keep things active? Um, well, um, one way is to do the sort of uh, DLU method. So you can limit the times uh, during which people come online in order to concentrate all your players into one time. It also removes the problem of the server gradually becoming inactive because there is no time uh, in which for it to become gradually inactive because it just isn't up for very long. Um, so um, you can try to just keep the players active even when fewer players are online, but that in turn requires some form of other variation of the game and or some sort of progression. Or you can uh, get an incentive for people to organise themselves to play with others. But again, that's pretty difficult. Um, without any sense, without anything for you to do with the other people. And for something to be worth doing, we need some sort of variation and or progression. So everything keeps coming back to that. Um, and the point is that enough variation will not only hold players, but it will give people online, say, lots of video content, which will increase interest online, increasing hype, and increasing the community of excited people who aren't testers, but perhaps who want to interact with the game via the testers, which is definitely possible. Um, I mean, the number of people who watch streamers of various games, for instance, is a great example of that. Um, and then there are direct ways for people to interact with the community, such as getting player-made items into the game, uh, which is something that is possible, 
um, and may be done in future by uh, people such as DLU. And that also gets more people effectively testing. Um, so people not actually getting in into the game, but getting to feel as though they are effectively in the game. And that in turn ups the number of people being involved and increases the variation um, as well as just well as well as increasing the critical number of players without actually having players directly in the server. However, I specifically avoided um, going into much detail on scenarios which change based on our actions, which I mentioned earlier, um, as an example of the most general definition of variation um, for basically uh, saying the easiest way of doing that is to get more people in. Because there is one other really important way of doing that, and that's AI. So an interesting AI will react in some way to how you behave. And you know, for those of you who ever played the Van Carbon Survival minigame, you'll know that it's pretty hard to predict exactly where everything's going to do. You know it's going to all rush you, but it can be quite hard to tell what change um, meant that on one game you got killed at the first uh, spawning of the, I don't know, chainsaw uh, stromlings, and uh, what in the other game lets you get to 20 minutes, um, simply because you make loads and loads of decisions without particularly thinking about them at the time. Um, and so AI gives you this brilliant way of having something that is random, and so provides, ver it's sort of random, it certainly appears and feels random, and so it provides variation, but which isn't actually random, and so you can get better at it, and it can give you this idea of progression. Um, and so it gives you variation and progression in one, which probably leaves quite a few of you thinking, deal you as had that guy. Why are you suddenly talking about it? But they're used to relying on large numbers of testers to generate activity, and so they never actually capitalised on the AI, uh, which was somewhat ironic given it was server load which slowed down the AI to the point of unplayability. Perhaps, and I should clarify, I don't know it was solely server load, but I can only imagine that an increased pressure on the server increases the number of things the, uh, the AI has to, for want of a better phrase, think about, um, and general pressure on the server slows, would slow down the machine. Um, so, had perhaps there been uh, deal you had not had as uh, short a test, as condensed a testing phase, and perhaps spread it out a bit more, they might have had fewer people online at once, which means fewer areas, say, in which AI was spawned and or being activated uh, by the presence of players, which would in turn have meant that actually the AI, AI would have run faster and it would have been more playable, um, which ironically would have meant that the server would have had a better chance of staying uh, working, um, staying active for longer. Um, and it's also quite important to note we are unlikely to see AI in the in upcoming testing. Uh, I mean, directly Frost in this winter test, Frostberg isn't a world which will be hurt by a lack of hostile AIs, and Neilberg's unlikely to be either. Um, which in turn means that DLU, at least for the Winterberg. Winterberg, winter testing, sorry, um, will need to play with the concentration of players yet again in order to get that critical mass of players they need to make the game enjoyable and to basically get no uh, good YouTube videos out there because let's face it, they don't, deal you doesn't overly need testers for testing purposes. I don't see many bug reports being produced by the testers. They're mostly used for publicity and good PR and to some extent stress testing. Um, yeah, um, the other thing to discuss is when do we think, you, know, you can tell the points where I'm going vaguely off script, uh, is when do we think that um, AI might work its way into the game. So for those of you who kept up to date, Halloween came with it um, AI, which was brilliant. Um, or when I say AI, specifically it came with it movement. Um, and so the question is, okay, we've got movement. Um, do we think it will come up in the next uh, testing video, um, of the next testing phase? And for those of you who don't know, um, I have mentioned this in a couple of videos in the past, but I'll mention it again. DLU, um, Darwin recently put out on the uh, DLU testing um, Discord, a basically a message saying uh, all changes above 
this point are considered to be part of the old code base and thus there's basically no guarantee they'll exist in the current code base. I think if this they've forgotten pretty much to update the uh, change log past that point. Um, but the point is, we can't just assume that because something appeared in a previous uh, version of DLU, it will appear in this one. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't personally expect too much more than we see in the winter testing uh, to occur in the actual closed beta. Because let's look at the timeline we roughly have, and I roughly laid out in my previous video. Um, We've got winter testing, which we know a decision will be made on, letting the people in on the 18th. We then really don't have much time for getting a closed beta, um, getting people to um, submit themselves for closed beta by the time of, the tw of December the 25th. So I don't know why I didn't just say Christmas. We won't have time for um, closed beta to open up by Christmas or to be decided on by Christmas so most likely it's it's unlikely maybe we'd have the sort of official sign yourself up for closed beta on Christmas day I could see that happening but primarily the winter testing will be going on and still you don't want anything or anyone to really detract from that um, then off the back of that and sort of not really off the back of it but sort of continue its hype it would make a lot of sense for them to continue um, to continue their testing um, or to uh, no to continue their sort of hype by making um, the close uh, the closed beta sort of submission uh, submissions applications would be a better word um, sort of occur in the run up to the new year decide perhaps on New Year's Eve um, which would still fall under their uh, decide by the end of the year they could do with less auspicious dates I'm solely uh, speculating on these and then Darwin has stated um, that he wants to get people in uh, early 2020 or he wants to yeah have the actual testing phase begin early 2020 we don't know what early 2020 is though could be anywhere from January to February I doubt it would be March but my point basically being we shouldn't expect huge gains to be made between the winter testing um, and the next testing because mostly, if I were Darwin at any rate, he's expecting a lot more players coming onto the server. So focusing on stability makes the most sense. Winter testing would be good to do some testing of stability, but particularly if we have large numbers of players coming in, stability is going to be the primary thing you really want to make certain you have. Um, anyway, with that, so that said, I don't think in this first round of closed beta testing we're going to be getting AI, which adds to my previous predictions that there will be multiple rounds of closed beta testing, which will allow uh, Darwin to slowly increase the player numbers. I don't know how close they'll be together, and this is solely a prediction, but it's just making more and more sense as we see uh, more and more about what DLU promises. So. It should be fairly clear at this stage what I think the turning point, is, what the turning point is going to be when we finally move from a waiting community to a gaming community. It's going to be a server. It's going to have stable. It's going to be a stable server, sorry. Uh, it's going to have AI, and it's going to be open for longer periods of time with a reasonable number of testers. But it doesn't have to be a huge number of testers. Um, it's unlikely to be dual use closed beta because. Either the AI isn't likely to be hugely stable, and that if it even appears at all, um, and we don't have any information on how long at a time the servers will be open. However, let's look at what happens once we get AI, because this is the point where I start to get excited, and I quite like getting excited. So the AI will inject variation into the game, as well as a sense of progression, because you can always get better at Vanguard and survival. Um, no one. I, okay, aside from finding hiding places, no one ever really managed to survive indefinitely because you just keep getting more and more mobs. More and more mobs? Entities? Yeah, I don't actually know what you... I feel like, I felt like I was going too Minecrafty, but I don't know what the term is. Now you... Um, well, I mean, stromlings would be the general term, more of the maelstrom, but I don't know what the sort of technical term for an entity in a game's enemy actually would probably be. Anyway, uh, uh, rant aside, well not rant, just sort of 
rumblings. Um, this holds players, which keeps them playing for longer, uh, even without having as many other players online. In terms, this means that the server opening times don't have to be constricted in order to keep players up, numbers up, which in turn means that people will have time to get more attached to their accounts and to progress within them, which gives an increased feeling of progression. So not only do you feel yourself getting better, you also see your account getting better. And that sort of combines to make you feel as though when your account gets a better weapon, it's sort of hard to tell how much is you getting better, how much is you having a better weapon, which gives you a feeling that you're getting even better than perhaps you are. At this point, people might try get, oh, an example of this is, I'm pretty certain that's what makes uh, Agario so addictive, um, because people feel like they're getting better when maybe they are getting a little better, but also as you get better, you just spend more time being larger and spend more time eating other things, which gives you the feeling of being better. At which point people might try getting into teams to compete in the uh, uh, AGS, the Vanguard Survival, with other players. And when things get competitive, as the speedrun thing showed, activity does go up. And yes, I know we only had a limited number of people try out the speedrun, but that was getting even a couple of people to set up their own uh, versions of Willis and uh, getting, yeah, a even a couple of people to work on the same thing at once, which is more than we've had in ages. When was the last time outside of a testing phase we had multiple people simultaneously um, setting up servers themselves to do stuff? I genuinely can't think of that time. Um, so imagine the boost from something where lots of people can compete uh, in a game which they find more fun and which importantly requires no server setup from them. All of this, sorry, you can hear people talking, all of this goes into meaning lots of players are online at once, meaning people are far less likely to stop by, find no one there and go inactive again. All in all, I'm just going to power through this, all in all, I believe I have said this before, but I really think AI could be the turning point for these projects. The question, however, is how well a project actually capitalises on having that AI. And there's the other huge question. Do you really want a load of hype over your project? That's something that I do intend on discussing in another video coming soon. However, I also want to make a video about a speedrunning challenge, uh, which was posted by a user called, I believe, Dirk Dirk on the DLU forums the other day, and which I definitely intend on looking into and putting out to people such as Preveteer, who was the person who made it down to 27.27 seconds uh, for the monument speedrun. Anyway, hopefully you enjoyed this, because I know I did far more than my previous attempt at this sort of video, which was just me complaining. Um, so uh, my notes just say traditional outro. So, hope you enjoyed. I've been Intravalue. You. If you're new to this channel, don't forget to subscribe to the developer channels, uh, like all their videos, etc. Um, I'll put links to all of them in the description. Um, I hope you're hyped for DLU. Let me know if you think I've forgotten anything. Um, have I overestimated how much AI will bring to the game? Are there other things you think could add stuff to the game? Uh, one obvious example I can think of off the top of my head would be PvP, although that is a contentious issue on its own. Um, as to whether or not PvP should be added. Anyway, that all said, um, it is yeah, one o'clock here. Um, I've utterly wasted my lovely 13 hours of sleep I managed to get last night with you know, probably limited number tonight. Thank you for listening. I've been Intravalue. See you around.